So today I'm going to read from the book Building Mathematics Learning Communities Improving Outcomes in Urban and in Urban High Schools by Erica N. Walker Forward by Bob Moses This video is chapter one Urban high school students and mathematics, myths and realities. Youth and specifically high school students are often constructed in media in multiple ways that portray them as disaffected and uninterested in school. However, urban adolescents, particularly black and Latino students, are unique in that they are most often and popularly portrayed in ways that diminish attention to them as intellectuals. They are portrayed as commonly engaged in criminal behavior, resistant to education and learning, and disrespectful to adults. As Morel describes, only one only needs to browse the newspaper of any major city or watch popular television shows or major news film releases to gain a sense of the popular messages circulating about the urban poor and people of color. These depictions largely construct urban students, particularly black and Latino teenagers, in ways that diminish the importance of attending to their academic and intellectual selves. Because popular culture shapes and reflects the beliefs of Americans, these depictions of urban schools, classrooms, and students can reflect the shape, reflect and shape the assumptions with which pre-service teachers enter urban classrooms. In my work, I have discovered that such depictions, whether in the press or in popular culture, filter and factor strongly into the perceptions that pre-service teachers and in-service teachers hold of their own students and how their families and friends construct urban youth for them. Said one teacher, Abby, I see a lot of people have seen those urban high school movies that Hollywood puts out that kids are running around and drugs are all over and guns and that I didn't see. Who knows if it is there? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But it was one of those things where I was I don't want to say pleasantly surprised. Maybe I was just snapped back to reality. When I came down here, I was like, yeah, I'm going to take a job in Harlem school. Really, friends of mine back in Connecticut, and it sounds hoity-toity, but they'd ask, have you lost your mind? What are you doing going to Harlem to work? Are you nuts? I won't lie, it was a little nerve-wracking, but it's one of those things where it's a neighborhood. You know, they have kids, and kids need to be taught. They have teachers. Sometimes they get forgotten about. Who knows? But I first felt like when we go there, the kids are going to be horrible and the teachers are going to have no clue what they're doing and it's just going to be just mayhem. It's nothing of the sort. Understanding urban high school students and their mathematics performance in school requires that we contest common and popular depictions of urban students and recognize that those depictions affect how they are viewed and treated in school by school adults. In addition, mathematics is a special discipline constructed in a particular way by the media and society like no other. The traditional depictions of mathematics as the purview of nerdy, socially outcast men, largely, have an impact on how young people and adults view the subject and the people who do mathematics well. 
For some students, being a mathematics person seems a subverting, means subverting that part of one's identity that makes a person interesting and cool. This chapter examines the myths and realities about urban high school students and mathematics and how those myths and realities affect issues of mathematics teaching and learning. Mathematics in popular culture and the media. Unfortunately, the dominant depiction of mathematics in media and popular culture in the United States is that of a discipline that only a select few people do. There is a prevalent view that people who do well in mathematics do so naturally. Consequently, unlike other disciplines that we believe require hard work, good writing can be developed. For example, our societal emphasis on mathematics as a difficult subject in which we expect few people to do well hampers our development of mathematically proficient people of all backgrounds. We accept underachievement in mathematics as a natural state of affairs, unlike the prevailing expectation in some other countries that all students master a level of mathematical understanding equivalent to that attained by only our best students. This perception of mathematics as a purview of a select few is particularly damning for students who are considered to be outside of the mainstream. And indeed, perceptions of people are also defined by where and how they are absent. When do you see representations of people doing mathematics, black and Latino people are conspicuously absent when we do see representations. In fact, the people who are doing mathematics are usually construed as a little odd or weird or with substantial mental problems. While some might argue that it would be no great thing to have blacks and Latinos as represented in such a negative light, their absence from representations of these careers in media and their usual presence in limited sports, entertainment, and problematic spheres filters into the societal consciousness. As one of my graduate students once said, I would kill for a, posi a positive stereotype about black kids that didn't involve sports or entertainment. A recent advertisement for Intel seen in Sports Illustrated makes this very clear. With a graphic of photographs of high school age students labeled as overachievers, as though in a high school yearbook overlaid with mathematical equations, not one of the 12 or so students represented appeared to be black or Latino. Such an advertisement sends a clear message. Overachievers are predominantly white, male, or of Asian descent. When that image is juxtaposed with the number of images of black athletes in the magazine, the message sent is startling in its positioning of blacks as physically gifted and whites and Asians as intellectually so. It is certainly true that urban youth and blacks and Latinos are not the only ones missing from positive discourses about mathematics. Women's positioning with regard to mathematics is also problematic. The furor that emerged from the talking Barbie doll that said, math class is tough in 1992, and former Harvard University President Lawrence Summers comments in 2005 about women's underrepresentation in the sciences being largely due to differential availability of aptitude at the highest levels between men and women were largely indicative of the public's recognition that words and images have power and influence girls and women and boys and men's constructions of themselves as potential 
mathematics doers. Even a film like Salt in 2010, an action movie and spy thriller in which the female protagonist is a herald operative who works for the CIA, contributes to society societal perceptions of mathematics as the purview of the male in a scene in which the protagonist, Salt, has demonstrated her capability to escape and survive, she pauses for a conversation with a young neighbor. Salt asks what she's doing, and the little girl says she's doing her math homework. I hate math, says the super capable spy. Researchers such as Picker and Berry and Moreau, Mendick and Epstein have written extensively about television shows, movies, A Beautiful Mind, Goodwill Hunting, and books, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, and continue to portray math as something that odd men and boys do or downplay women's talent in math. Moreau and colleagues reported that the students in their study, secondary school students as well as mathematics and humanities undergraduates, had several stereotypes of mathematicians. Students had specific ideas about how mathematicians look and how they act. In particular, mathematics was written on the body. Mathematicians had certain physical characteristics. They were odd looking with wild hair, for example, and they were largely represented as white and male. Students also felt that mathematicians had some mental or social issues, lived lives that were dominated by mathematics and rarely did anything else. In similar studies with teachers, researchers found that teachers described mathematicians similarly. A study by Cirillo and Herbal Einsenman found that teachers often position mathematicians as having special talents that real people do not have, and therefore the average person cannot do mathematics. In addition, teachers may construe some positive behaviors of mathematicians as negative. For example, seeking efficient ways to solve problems was characterized as laziness. Further, the work of mathematicians is construed as isolating and rooting in historical problems rather than the social and collaborative activity it, is, it often is, and the important use of mathematics in solving contemporary problems is often underemphasized in mathematics classes. Too often, even when students and teachers question the images of mathematicians in media, they are unable to refer to some alternative representation of mathematicians, possibly because of the lack of these available within their experiences of school mathematics and popular culture. There are at least two alternate media representations that present black or Latino youth as capable of mathematics. Stand and Deliver, a movie based on the true story of Jamie Escalante, a mathematics teacher at East Los Angeles Garfield High School, and A Different World, a television show that portrayed the lives of predominantly black students attending a fictional, historically black college, Hillman, simultaneously Rifi reify the shad and shatter stereotypes about students of color and mathematics. Jamie Escalante's success at Garfield High School in East Los Angeles, increasing the number of students taking AP calculus courses and the AP examination for full credit, for college credit, is well known and undeniable. At one point in the 1980s, more than 25% of the Latino students taking the AP Calculus examination in the United States were from Escalante's mathematics program at Garfield. 
several articles and research reports, e.g. Escalante and Derman, 1990, Lanier, 2010, Meek, 1989, have described Escalante's work with the predominantly working class and poor Latino student population. Despite these reports and Escalante's own narrative, Escalante and Derman, 1990, of his work with and for students, Stand and Deliver as a piece of media stands as the definitive portrait of Escalante's work. The students in Stand and Deliver are portrayed largely as gang members and unruly and disrespectful students whose parents are less committed to their, stu their children's education. Grant, 2002, Pimento, 2010. Before Escalante's work, before Escalante's, Escalante works his magic on them, his mathematics teaching becomes a vehicle for the student's transformation from hooligans and daydreamers. Because their eventual success is regarded by the powers that be as improbable, their credibility are impunged before students and teachers are vindicated by students demonstrating repeated success on the AP examination. While the film eventually goes to lengths to portray the students as knowledgeable and engaged in mathematics, it arguably goes to even greater lengths to portray them in the stilted stereotypical images of urban Latinos. The viewers of the movie are left with the message that it is a surprise that these students can excel in mathematics. The film itself might not have been made despite the local Spanish language press attention to Garfield's success over the years. It wasn't until the ETS testing Fuhrer Fuhrer in 1982 that Escalante and Garfield gained widespread attention in the media notably in the Los Angeles Times. Further, as many have observed, the film omits that it actually took Escalante eight years to build up the program to the success recounted in the movie, that for many years he had strong administrative support and later financial support from private foundations, and that there was a team of teachers who bought into his philosophy and that together they changed the culture of mathematics in the school. Applebaum, 1995, describes the media rhetoric and portrayals of Escalante as part of a public mytho mythology, mythology about super teachers who can accomplish miracles in tough environments supposedly against the odds. Pimento notes that her teacher education students when reviewing the film believe that the fact that such a movie was made at all about Latino taking a and passing the AP exam and the presentation of this as a novelty speaks volumes about societal expectations for urban Latinos. Shockingly, and in contrast to Stand and Deliver, very little research has been done examining the possible cultural impact of A Different World, 1987 to 1993, on adolescents' educational aspirations. A Different World was the first television show to regularly depict young black people in college classrooms. While there are numerous essays and commentaries in the popular press that suggest that this television show was responsible for an increase in black adolescents' interest in college and attending historically black colleges and universities during the 1990s in particular, there is little empirical research on the issue. Developed and produced by Bill Cosby, well known for his interest in education, A Different World was a spin-off 
the immensely popular The Cosby Show, 1984 to 1992, following one of its main characters, Denise Huxtable, off to college. One might have been, one might argue that the experiences of the eldest daughter, Sandra Huxtable, at Princeton might have been worth chronicling as well. But rather than focus on a different world's many positive images of black students and its portrayal of blacks of multiple and complex backgrounds and experiences, I wish to focus on one mind-bending subversive character, Dwayne Wayne, an uber nerd from Philadelphia who not only became cool but got the girl but also was shown doing math, loving math, earning a PhD in math, and embarking on what appeared to be a research career in mathematics. What a brilliant, what is brilliant about the characterization of Dwayne Wayne is that the different world writers allowed him to shift and mature from nerdy, socially clueless, yet caring misfit to an intellectual, attractive, and urban adult who showed America that we had not seen on the, who showed America what we had not seen on the small screen, a mathematically talented black American. Steve Urkel on Family Matters, whose interests were primarily scientific, was soon to follow. But unlike Dwayne Wayne, he was commonly the butt of jokes and remained helplessly a nerd. Despite the development of a storyline that allowed his cool but callous alter ego, Stefan Urkel, to emerge. Also, Family Matters lacked any race-conscious context while a different world was firmly situated in the physical and cultural milieu of a historically black college. But Dwayne Wade, but Dwayne Wayne was unique in that his personality and humanity were not at odds with his mathematical abilities. He did not have the literal or figuratively did not have to literally or figuratively become a different person in order to excel. One young mathematician interviewed for my research project on Black American mathematicians described the impact of Dwayne Wayne on her decision to become a mathematics major in college. Did you watch A Different World? Anyway, I was in love with Dwayne Wayne. I thought I was so cool. Like, ooh, it's cool that he majored in math. I had this glorified image of going to an HBCU, historically black college or university, and majoring in math. I thought I was like cool, like Dwayne Wayne. Part of me was just like, I guess that will be okay. I guess that will be okay. Because I saw it. And I was just like, okay, well, I saw it on TV, so it's not crazy. Sadly, characters like Dwayne Wayne, a young black man from an urban area, smart, interested in mathematics, in college, and not a troublemaker, are few and far between in media today. Instead, we see that young people who are black and Latino, particularly in cities, are constructed in ways that reify destructive stereotypes and diminish their humanity. Unfortunately, in schools, this means that many educators have images of urban students that position them as uninterested in school and with limited intellectual potential. I share the example of Dwayne Wayne and the mathematician because it reminds us that narratives have power and further 
that positive narratives need to be shared, not just as counter narratives, but also as they as that they might be used to interrupt dominant narratives about achievement and who can and is expected to achieve at high levels. This is particularly true of the narrative about the mathematics achievement gap in the United States, especially as it pertains to urban schools and students. Framing the mathematics achievement gap. It is, an, it is interesting to note that the portrayal of African American students as poor performing is aligned with the broader stereotypes about African Americans as unmotivated and, unin and unintelligent. Nasir, Atukpawa, O'Connor, Davis, Wishnia, and Sang, 2009, page 232. While there is no generic, while there is no genetic evidence that students from underrepresented groups are inherently unable to do well in mathematics, the focus on achievement differences between groups that Asian American and white students perform better on, on standardized mathematics assessments, and Black and Latino students on average often in danger in genders assumptions about individual students abilities and potentials and mark entire groups of students as underachievers without critically analyzing the reasons for high and low performance further the methods of identifying mathematically talented students largely based on standardized test scores in most schools unfortunately help to perpetuate the myth that some groups of students are naturally better at mathematics than others. Performance gaps appear early in elementary school, persist throughout students' educational careers, and indeed, for some groups, widen as students progress through school. For example, the performance gap between black students and white students is narrowest in elementary school and widens as students progress through school. In math Mathematics, Asian American students on average have traditionally outperformed white students who in turn outperform Latino, Black, and Native American students. For example, in 2009, 52% of Asian American 12th graders scored at a proficiency level or, or above, at the proficiency level or above on the national assessment of Educational Progress, and AEP, Mathematics Assessment, compared with 33% of white students, 12% of Native American, 11% of Latino, and 6% NCES 2009. Although gaps in achievement among ethnic groups have narrowed during particular time periods since the initial NAEP administration in 1971, most notably in 1988 for 17-year-olds, gaps between the Black, Latino, and Native student population and the Asian and white student population persist. Unfortunately, the NCES does not routinely carry out and report examinations of interactions between demographic categories, for example, between gender and race, or socioeconomic status and race. Although some researchers, Strutchens, Lubinsky, McGraw, and Westbrook, 2004, have done this for specific NAEP years. I will discuss the gender-race interaction later in this chapter. But reasons for these differences in performance are complex and intricately related. 
substantial economic disparities and differing levels of parental and grandparental education reflect effects of both lingering and ongoing racial and ethnic discrimination and are significant reasons for the continued performance gaps. Patterns of housing segregation and discrimination are linked to rigid segregation and inequitable resources in urban schools. Evidence from the NCES in 2009 reveals that the NAEP scores are higher on average in low poverty versus high poverty schools and suburban schools average score 157 versus town schools and rural schools 151. There was no significant difference between NAEP scores in city schools 152 and those in suburban schools. But mean mathematics scores on the 2002 NAEP for students attending urban high poverty schools are considerably lower when compared with students attending schools in more prosperous districts. What we do know about urban school issues is that funding inequities and teacher shortages often result in urban school students being taught mathematics by teachers who are less qualified and more inexperienced than those who teach in suburban schools. In addition, urban school students who are overwhelmingly Black and Latino often receive mathematics instruction centered on the basic skills and repetition, rather than instruction that provides them with opportunities to learn and exercise higher order thinking skills. When computers are present in their schools, for example, they may be more likely to be used for basic skills rather than for mathematics exploration or enrichment. Although learning basic skills is necessary, this should not be the upper limit of what is expected from Black, Latino, and Native students. Finally, beginning in elementary school, Black and Latino children are more likely to attend schools with fewer monetary, circular, and staff resources than are their white and Asian counterparts. These deficiencies result in very real obstacles for Black and Latino high academic performance. Studies of elementary school achievement have shown that differences in academic outcomes are almost entirely explained by the quality of instruction that students receive and not by race or socioeconomic status. Darling Hammond, 1995. Further, when Black Latinos and Native Americans attend predominantly white elementary schools, they are less likely than Asian and white students to be placed in high ability groups. Opportunities